Peter and Zach are not experts, and everything they say should be taken with at least one grain of salt. Please keep your ears engaged throughout the whole podcast to prevent rampant confusion. Now, brace your mind for impact. Surf's up, my dudes! Welcome to another week of Friends and Theory. Oh, man. Your, your weekly dose of science and goodness applied directly to your ear. Sun's out, gun's out. I'm Peter Batstone. Um, I'm, I'm Zach Brew. I couldn't think of anything cool uh, to say, but um, it's still true, so... Doesn't matter, I don't... Uh, because your beach body is ready. Yeah. Um, ready to be buried in the sand. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is nice though, isn't it? Sun's out. It, um, it's it's crazy good. We're inside recording a podcast. Yep. Just how well, I mean, it I, I be. was I was out working on a railway track for eight hours yesterday. Oh man! So I do I do have a bit of a burn and a tan going. Um, but that's all by the by. I've also had to move room because we have solar panels on our roof, and because it's a really good day. The inverter now just sounds like an overheating computer. Oh man! And so, so the the entire room kind of sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're keeping up the high intensity, impactful science journalism that you're used to on Friends of Theory. Yes. Enough about um, all the dumb stuff we've been doing. What what's been going on in science? Uh, I'll start. Zach. With one, oh, okay. If you want, it's kind kind of felt like you were leading me on there, but fine, well, I was, go. but then I realised that I have the first story, so um... <laughs> <laughs> professional as always. Yeah, let's go. Zach. Let's go. Um, right, first of all, what uh, do you feel about sleeping? How do you feel about sleeping? Um, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I think we should sleep more. There are people who um sleep at unusual times of the day or like sleep late at night yeah can't or, uh, can't get <laughs> i was to gonna sleep. say they go to bed at like 11 and wake up at seven and stuff That's yeah they, they they're awake through the night i guess would be more <laughs> accurate to say um yeah so people who are like night owls and things there's been a bit of study on a gene mutation it's in a gene called cry one which is a bit sad cry1 nice. uh and the cry one gene uh, is a known part of the kind of circadian clock, which is basically like the the body clock and things like that, isn't it? I think. Um, yeah, like loads of things have <clears throat> circadian clocks and circadian rhythms, and yeah. ours is is fairly synced up to you know daytime, nighttime. Right. <laughs> so a mutation in this gene, uh, which was discovered in a person with the de- delayed sleep phase disorder, was yeah w- was basically found to be linked with his, with the inability to sleep according to a regular kind of schedule. And they went on to study more individuals. They found that um, those with the mutation in CRY1 gene uh, had sleep periods around two to four hours out of phase with what you'd normally expect. Hmm. Um, But don't worry, because if you have this mutation, if you can't get to sleep properly, uh, they recommended that you just set yourself a strict schedule and eventually you'll be able to kind of get into the habit. (laughs) Of it, I guess. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, know, but yeah. that's interesting, I guess. You know, there's a genetic link between uh, what times people want to have a nap nap. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, in your genes. My genes. <laughs> let's, let's, no, no, let's, let's not go let's there. Shut, we're shutting that goof down right now. Shut it down. Uh, what that, have you got for us? I've got, well, I say dino controversy. Not really. Um, there's been a big old, big old paleontology dig in the west coast of oh, australia yeah. nice and um they they published all their their findings in the journal of vertebrae paleontology um and so this is this is like i think it was 200 kilometer stretch of you know like shoreline and it used to be all muddy sort of 130 million years ago <laughs> so now it's sandstone um yeah. and there's around 21 different species here and the the big deal is they kept finding several tracks that were 1.7 meters wide. 
One point seven meters. Yeah, that's that's like, you know, I mean, I I would say nearly as tall as I am, but like no one really knows how tall I am. <laughs> well, you're <laughs> so one, one point seven meters, I guess. That's so. That was just the individual footprint. Yeah, and unless Jesus. unless this was and like. I trust them to have done, you know, a far enough job to, you know, check if it was just like a coincidence that kept happening or was it just yeah. like a dinosaur prank or something. <laughs> they yeah, knew. pranksters. They knew we'd be digging later. Yeah. Um, but so given our like knowledge of dinosaurs, you know, they tend to, and, and most life forms don't have, you know, weird out, there's, there's not just like a couple of species that have weird out of proportion limbs. So yeah. this isn't this isn't just like a regular sized dinosaur with massive feet. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, they predicted it would be sort of between five point three and five point five meters wide at the hip. Jeez, uh, was there it's any pretty, indication pretty of what, thick. what type of creature it was at all? Um, it would probably be herbivore. I think it is. Right. Um, didn't really have that sort of clawy look to it and <laughs> yeah you know the, the bit most of the bigger dinosaurs were herbivores yeah you got your your big um sauropods and things like that yeah oh good and they'll sneeze on you if you go in a tree yeah just like in that one film um, yeah that one documentary yeah right, we're not doing another jurassic park no, every let's get out of here <laughs> um have you <laughs> got another one you want to share um I thought I thought we're doing a, a me to you, you to me sort of thing. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, we, we can do that. I'm, I'm throwing this baseball back to you. All right, I, I've got it. Um, speaking of dinosaurs, actually, mm-hmm. um, some more. Again, it's a, it's a, it's kind of dino controversy. I think since there was that really big dinosaur overhaul a couple of weeks back, basically dinosaurs have just been the really hot thing in science publications. Um, yeah, it's like it's like anything goes now. Yeah, almost. I mean, they are always popular, but at the moment it's ridiculous. And we did, we, we had a, I think there was a story this week that I actually decided not to put in to save space. But like, dino controversy is is wild right yeah. now. I mean, the, the thing is, right, I, I guess I, I don't read scientific publications all the time. Um you know, so I certainly don't go around reading journals all the time anymore. Um, don't admit that on the podcast, <laughs> Jesus. I mean, I read journals when we're when we're researching, and um, but most of my stuff comes through, you know, um, regular science news or whatever. But like, yeah. I just wanted to make a kind of side point, I suppose, which is that science publications have all the same kind of trappings and trends that regular media does. Um, oh yeah, yeah, like. People who are studying and writing papers about what's currently popular are more likely to get published and and stuff like that. It's like it, exactly. It's it's a shame, but that's the way of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not really like a necessarily a criticism, although it can be a downside sometimes. But yeah, I just I guess it's just you you um when you think of science publication, maybe you think of it as a very sterile kind of very organized. Uh, environment but actually it's mostly just people scrambling to get the popular stuff and get published as far as i can like there was there was that guy who had like no reason to believe it but was conducting you know studies into how homeopathy works you know the water memory theory like stuff like that because it's got a buzzword in the title basically yeah that that worked for him for a bit yeah until it got like thoroughly debunked yeah so anyway uh on to the story um (laughs) it's about um the asteroid, the the dinosaur asteroid, is a leading theory for dinosaur extinction, but there mm-hmm. is still a lot of debate about this, um, which maybe people don't don't realize. Like, um, I don't want to give you the impression that the the, the asteroid strike is uh, is kind of not recorded well because we do know it happened and so on, but it's mainly the the extent to which it actually affected uh, dinosaur extinction. Um, there's recently been a paper from the Heidelberg University. Uh, the group there have kind of suggested that maybe the actual impact of the asteroid wasn't as much as uh, we thought it was. They were saying that there was a, a definite gradual decline um, of the dinosaurs and pterosaurs before the actual impact 
and the mass extinction. <laughs> I mean, tell that to the dinosaurs that actually got hit by the asteroid. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, <laughs> they were talking about how there was actually a, like a, a significant rise of bird species as dinosaurs declined and that all of these kind of crossing factors could have basically been sending the dinosaurs out before the, the impact even happened, which could be true. But like I read the the paper itself um, as much as as I could, and I, I I thought it was a little bit weird because they basically just looked at a fossil uh, assemblage. They were seeing a bunch of footprints, actually, again footprints, and they they were judging this entirely off of like the the relative proportions of the footprints that they were seeing. So they they mm. only saw one predatory dinosaur, and they saw quite a lot of bird footprints and so on. So. I, yeah, I'm not and, uh, sure what did birds what did birds evolve from Zach just yeah a reminder yeah dinosaurs um, exactly I I don't know it, it's modern, it's an modern birds theory. I should say there's certainly evidence to suggest that volcanism and climate change and things like this were having an impact on on dinosaurs before the the asteroid strike and that maybe they would have gone extinct anyway uh, and certainly a number of species had had gone extinct. And where others were in decline, but to suggest that the the asteroid strike actually had no effect on dinosaurs, I think is a is a bit of a stretch, to be honest. In my opinion, I don't think they were saying it did nothing. I think I think it was more of a you know scaling back from the idea that it it wiped out you know like ninety percent of all things, and rather you know just yeah not just quite hit, you know like twenty percent of. What well, wasn't already how know, how much out, but... of an impact it actually had? Yeah, yeah, um, but the, the ramifications of an asteroid hitting the Earth go beyond you know just squishing something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, the... I thought I'd talk about it because um, I there was I I just felt like that there was also a bit of crossover between the the news article that I read and the actual paper itself about the actual point of the study, and I felt like the article itself was kind of pushing the the whole the asteroid didn't do that much kind of side of things whereas the paper seemed to be more just about um an interesting kind of assemblage of fossil footprints so i guess that's the way it goes doesn't it everyone like takes something from yeah you know a a published paper or study and then they take that like one part and run their narrative with it yeah and i'm sure we we will actually i've got a story that relates to that i'm sure we do that to a certain extent as well like you you kind of want to have a nice narrative I mean, story, nobody's but... perfect, but we're pretty close. <laughs> anyway, it's an interesting one because I guess um, it's kind of also an example of how science media can be kind of uh, changed and altered and, um, you know, keep your eyes open if you're reading science stuff and just uh, get 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 different sides of the story if you can and so on. It's all good. Yeah. So there you go. Right. So, Zach, um, what kind of color pattern do you look for in a in a man? Wow, um, man, um, that's a hard question to answer. It's one hell of a segue. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, what should I be looking for? Uh, well, that that sounds like the answer of, of a small-brained female guppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this oh. is a study published in Evolutionary Biology. Um, I, I can't actually remember like what the objective was, but the, uh, the bulk yeah. of the study was... <laughs> There were guppies with different brain sizes and they were judging the way they perceived colour patterns and what mates they select. Oh, I've actually uh, heard about this, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, so well, what was the, the idea that um, like a, a guppy with a bigger brain was able to more effectively choose a, a Yeah, partner? you know, like more cognitive function, better decision making, that kind yeah. of thing. So what were the really um, good colours? In terms w- of guppy, um, well, reading. they didn't actually make that clear, but <laughs> <laughs> and let me give you the rundown on the on the study. Real yeah, quick. sure. So there were guppies. There was like a strain of guppies bred for you know varying brain sizes, so that you know significantly different to the wild type guppies. Right. So males have colors that are associated with attractiveness in the species. Okay. Um, and so the female guppies with the larger brains and perhaps greater cognitive function um and also wild type they had a strong preference for the attractive colored males 
but the small-brained guppies showed no preference. Right. Okay. So, again, like with with less with less processing, they basically had less drive for sexual selection and actually choosing a good yeah. partner as opposed to just choosing. And, and any we've partner. talked about sexual selection before and how it's a little bit bunk. And this this study gets gets <laughs> into that as well because uh, they did a color test of all the different strains. And it showed that um, the base evidence of color was not the deciding factor for what they saw as attractive. So right. it's like a part of it, but those those big brain female guppies know something that we don't about the men that they are selecting. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's that it's that the big brains were also selecting for other less obvious features or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that's what um, that's the conclusion they came to. Yeah, and it's that's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting. I mean, lots of animals put put in a lot of energy and um, and effort into creating, you know, display features and and actually then displaying them. So yeah, it's a... I like to wear you know like full reflective gear. <laughs> it makes you really yeah. stand out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I prefer like stealth camouflage. Um... <laughs> yeah, you like with camouflage shorts again. Yeah. Yeah, the free the the cargo shorts, the three quarter length. Yeah, they're per- perfect, perfect. All right, Zach, let's let's keep it fish related. Yeah, we're staying fish related. Got some some different fish though. Fish that live in caves, otherwise known as cave fish. Um, mm. Also they, known as cave fish. Yeah, AKA. <laughs> uh, they live in lots of places around the world because I guess caves are are fairly similar, like freshwater cave systems are fairly similar in different places around the world is what i'd guess yeah everywhere's an ecosystem you know and yeah we we have systems for classifying you know everything which is why the definitions for grasslands isn't you know dedicated to just like one area or you know temperate forest and stuff um which i guess you could argue is just you know how how we do patterns and how we make stuff fit yeah, into our world theory. Definitely. But it works. It, works. it helps. I mean, interestingly, you, s- you say that because, uh, like, these cave fish seem to to kind of display that these ecosystems are similar as well. Because, um, interestingly, recently, a team from Germany, from the University of Constance, did some genetic studies on a cave fish which was discovered in Germany by a diver. Uh, which happens to be the first cave fish in Europe discovered. Um, nice. Which is we interesting. We're on the map and, now. And uh, like you're saying, the ecosystems tend to be similar. Well, we can see very common adaptations in the cave fish in Germany to cave fish that we see in the US and China and other places like that. Um, so things like um, they have pale bodies compared to surface dwelling fish. They have small eyes large nostrils and barbels and other sensory features like that that don't require light. And um, another interesting thing was that this this population seemed, based on the genetic studies, to be a very young one. It diverged from the surface population less than 20,000 years ago, possibly quite a lot more recently than that. Um, that's, that's pretty quick. Yeah, so... In terms of... In evolutionary time. and evolution, yeah. Yeah, in, in evolutionary time, you know, a, a mere few thousand years possibly has allowed these cave fish to, to adapt and converge on what we know are, um, you know, classic cave dwelling fish features in Germany. So yeah. Right. It's pretty cool. Man, what, what do you think leads to that sort of rapid evolution? Because that's pretty mad. Um, I, I suppose a, like a significant difference in environment, but not, not a difference that, um, that caused that species to go extinct, obviously. Like it, the species was able to adapt, but not only that, the environment was, um, suitable that the fish could adapt quite freely. Um, so at some point, this cave system, uh, which apparently is really, really hard to get to um where these they found these fish mm. was opened up at some point um possibly by ice melting or, or some other kind of thing like that and the fish from the surface called loaches 
Um, some of them went into the caves, became a separate population because the surface dwelling fish and the cave dwelling fish weren't kind of interacting anymore for some reason. It could just be distance or or some other factor that um, they just didn't separated. get along anymore. Yeah. And eventually, all of those cave dwelling um, species have natural selection acting on them. You know, selecting for features which are beneficial in a cave, um, such as having um, better better sense of um, smell or, or or taste, and then the eyes and so on would be lost because they're not really important. So, um, a a baby fish who's born with smaller eyes or, or weaker eyes has no disadvantage in that population because there's no light anyway. So. It's, yeah, so it's not big eyes would just be a waste of energy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's quite a little, it's quite a nice little sort of micro view of how um, selection and evolution can happen in in quite a short time span between two populations like this. So to summarize, live in a cave. Eyes aren't important. Don't talk to your relatives. <laughs> well. If you want to be a cave fish, then then yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's our there hot go. tip. Hot tip for this week. Exactly. Right, Zach. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't have a good goo for this. Um, how much? <laughs> how much do you know about your microbiome? Because I don't know anything about mine. It's my, probably not in great condition to be my honest. My microbiome. I yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's um just got lots of lots of lots of books and wires and and computer stuff in it at the moment I, am, I mis- on edible? am i misunderstanding what a microbiome <laughs> is <laughs> please yeah, illuminate okay. me everybody has a microbiome it's it's what's what's you but not you so all the different oh, species of okay. bacteria live everywhere in your body yeah okay i understand now and <laughs> And do things, and they they play a really important role in like everything from managing inflammation to disease to digestion, yeah, to all kinds of crazy things. And so this this is um a study from the Endocrine Society, and uh, I found I found an article on Science Daily about it, and um, they're reporting that a deep transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, <sighs> it, you know, it's a non-invasive brain stimulation can alter the microbiome and make people healthier right so you can kind of take control of of your the, like the the biome which your body presents and yeah but, but we shape through like our diet and control um, um what kind of hygiene. parasites and bacteria and stuff you have yeah kind of um but they, they in previous studies by the same group they have they it led to reduced food cravings and induced weight loss in some of the participants Okay. So they took that idea and they they went hog wild with it. I say hog wild. <laughs> it's not not a great. <laughs> it's not a huge study. The study involved fourteen subjects. Uh, they're split into two groups. One group received fifteen of um, these DTMS sessions over five weeks, and they targeted the insula and prefrontal cortex. While the other group, um, you know, the control group, yeah. was just getting you know a, a garbage sim- stimulation that did nothing. <laughs> um (laughs) okay so the dtms subjects uh lost more than three percent of their total body weight and more than four percent of their body fat over the period of the study and um they they were observing all kinds of different things from the participants as sort of as sort of health measures measurements okay they found that the stool samples of the dtms subjects which is um where you'd go to look for what kind of bacteria you have in your gutty works yeah (laughs) <laughs> they had altered microbiota composition, um, which right. is, is really interesting. So and by affecting higher levels of the good stuff, and um, there was also a general improvement in hormonal parameters. So, so and it, like the the brain has some kind of control over the actual like uh, conditions of your of the inside of your body, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, well, I guess it kind of has to. Otherwise, yeah. you might, you'd probably just die. That's, that's true. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, but to, to, I guess I, I but wouldn't. This, have... this sort of level of manipulation is crazy. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought it would be that 
kind of uh, small scale able to actually alter the species of bacteria and things that you have. But you know, I've got I've got some some salt here. Um, I'm going to take one grain of salt, um, and it it does seem a bit far fetched, and um, I couldn't find you know like a really strong link or anything. And again, there were only like seven participants, so. I guess it's something that will be studied more if it's um picked if it's up a thing something. yeah it's it's a pretty big deal, yeah, that does sound like a like a, a very curious way of of treating people and kind of improving health that I'd never really thought of before, yeah, um, yeah. but in case it's not a thing, and just as a general sort of health advice, remember you are what you eat um. Um, that's not literal. Please, no jokes. Um, <laughs> but it's like if you want to be healthy, you got to eat health, healthy things. So if you want a healthy microbiome, you gotta gotta eat balanced yeah. diet, lots of grons and and veggies <laughs> and fruits. Amazing. I think that's what they yeah. are. Um, and and you know probiotics like yogurt can be good too. Yeah. Um, so so you don't have to rely on non-invasive brain stimulation. Yeah. Because it's, it's not, you can't get it in the grocery store. Um, not yet. Not yet. Right. Well, from the the microbiome to the 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 wide the wide wide depths and and stretch of the universe, I guess the the, um, the macro cosmos. The macro cosmos. <laughs> <sighs> Man. Um, <laughs> soon. Possibly currently at the moment ongoing, um, something called the Event Horizon Telescope is being activated. Um, Talks the talk. Can it walk for walk? Yeah. That's so a big name. This is sort of a a telescope by way of being a combination of other telescopes. So I guess it's like some kind of um, multi, multi-unit multi telescope. Um, what they're doing okay, is so not like Voltron, which is the no, first thing I thought. Um, of. there's no filming of the head <laughs> or anything like that. Um, yeah, right. But that's um, the key difference. No, sorry. Go <laughs> on. Go on. <laughs> eight radio observatories around the world, including Spain, the United States, and Antarctica, uh, are going to be activating in synchronicity if the weather is clear enough. Uh, within the next week or so, I think it was. Um, and they're all pointed directly at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, where, as we know from previous weeks, the big old boy Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole, is mm-hmm. sitting. Um, and they're going to be trying to image the black hole for the, f- for the first time. They're going to try and get a clear image of the event horizon of Sagittarius yeah, A star. You can't, you can't see the black hole. No. Um, <laughs> that would just be a black image so so uh to give a quick recap i guess a black hole um you know has such a, a powerful amount of pull towards it that not even light can escape it and because light can't get from the black hole to you that means you can't see it directly but you can see the well you should be able to see a distortion at the boundary at which light can escape so like the the closest point at which light can still escape uh, which is called the event horizon so these um these eight observatories are going to be working together in order to try and image the event horizon of sagittarius a star which should be very interesting the images aren't going to be ready for a while but um it could be really really cool it could bring kind of black holes i guess out of the kind of mythical status that they they sort of have even though they are um, scientifically sound things um <laughs> and um they're gonna be energy i mean i guess i guess you could not believe in black holes if you wanted and like never suffer the consequences yeah. well i meant more that even if you even if we know <laughs> that black holes exist it's more like they're kind of uh, like Revered? distant science fictiony misunderstood Hmm. mystified kind of things um so the event horizon telescope is going to be collecting two petabytes of data every night that it images Uh, and to give you some context that's enough in one night to store the entire genomes of a third of all humans that are currently alive okay yeah yeah i mean 
My computer couldn't do that. No. Um, a petabyte is, what, a thousand terabytes? I, I don't quite know how uh, many levels up it is. It's at it's, least that, I think. Yeah, at least. I, I would have thought because it's we tend possibly to do more things than by that. thousands and terabytes or a thousand gigabytes. and. Yeah, that sounds about right, to be honest. It might be more. Who, who knows? It's a lot of I data, say though. who knows. I'm looking we forward to... We could just Google it. <laughs> we could, but... <laughs> I can't be bothered right now. Um, or Bing, or Yahoo. Other services are available. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but who cares about black hole pictures when you could have all kinds of mad sweet jewellery? Well, that is true. Um... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about prehistoric bling-bling today. Oh, yeah. Um it's a team at Griffith University in Australia published a study in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, which I did want to use the abbreviation, but it is yeah. PNAS. <laughs> that, that's the one they went for. I think the um, first class that you get in university is how to say PNAS without laughing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you got to kind of wonder if they did that deliberately or not, because it, it's the kind of thing I think they did deliberately. Well, it, it, so, scientists have a track record of doing a, stuff a like that. Like, you joke. Know, yeah. The Sonic Hedgehog gene and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> could be. Whatever. So they found some ornaments that were between 22,000 and 30,000 years old in an inland cave in Wallisia in Wallisia. I guess it would be Wallisia. Um, right. In Australia, and it it basically shows that people went through you know when they got over to Australia, the first thing they did was they started killing things and making jewelry. That's pretty nice. Um, That's pretty standard. Pretty behavior. standard behavior. Yeah. So yeah, um, from from exotic species. So there was oh, a, right. a finger bone of a bear cuscus, um, which would have been a necklace or bracelet. It has a little hole drilled in it. Okay. And there were some beads made from the tooth of a babirusa, which is the weird pig that impales itself. Oh my god. Wow. I don't know if you've seen it. It's the one where it's um, like has a tooth going through its own Oh right. Like, yeah, I've heard space. of that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. uh it's upsetting. That's my <laughs> that's my review of it. So But um there's a... I, I I've um sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Well okay, fine. Fine. I, I have a quote here from someone on the, on the study. Yeah. Um, for a long time, people thought that the spark of human brilliance and artistic genius came out of prehistoric Europe. But all these emerging findings show that there were complex, sophisticated, symbolic cultures flourishing on the other side of the world at the same time. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that that, like, culture was thought to originate in Europe, I guess. No, that, <laughs> actually, that was the first time I'd heard that as well. But um, but yeah, that's cool. Um, the the kind of emergence of cultural significance in, in things like this is very interesting. That's Well, that's again, cool. like, neither of us are archaeologists or prehistoric humans, No, but, so. um, I did but, study them a little bit, but not a, a huge amount. So it's very they, interesting. They, they chose to dig where they were digging because there are also loads of like cave paintings around there and stuff and so it, it basically shows that humans got cultural like everywhere at the same time sort of thing oh nice that's really um, that is curious well, i guess i mean i guess trends in culture are, are passed on to neighbors as well aren't they yeah Obviously, I, but... I, a part a part of me is a bit like we may be you know putting our modern ideas of what defines a culture onto well, yeah. Some very old evidence that, you know, might just be a tooth with a hole in it. But... Uh, yeah, but I guess in certain contexts, like, you can definitely tell that, that things have a have a, a function which is not merely practical, like... Um... Yeah, you know, it, it wasn't just like a tiny pickaxe. Yeah, exactly. So there's something interesting in that, even if... Um, doesn't yeah. quite fit what we think a culture is. Scientists do mm. their best, okay? Yeah. And good job, scientists. If you're an, you know, being an archaeologist or paleontologist in particular, you know, you're digging around and you're looking, you're looking for. It, it can be, it can be long and fruitless. And when you find something like this, it's a pretty big deal, to be honest. Yeah. Because a, a part of me is just like you just found a tooth and some beads. 
<laughs> Welcome no, to Threads and like, Theory. Exactly, yeah. The best science this, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let me peer review all these journals. Oh, uh, man. So, yeah, it, it's all about which perspective yeah, we look through it. Good. It's a, it's a pretty big finding. We can strong and well and dry and hey, everybody. Peter and Zach here. Hoping you're having a really great podcast and a happy... Friday slash Saturday. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we hope you are enjoying this episode, episode seven of Friends and Theory. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please get in contact with us. You can find us everywhere as Friends and Theory. And if you have to search for us, remember to use quotation marks, or you're going to get the TV show Friends and Theories relating to the TV show Friends. So, um, also, Twitter, our handle is at the underscore fatcast with a capital F, T, and C. And remember, you can find us on iTunes now as well, and our RSS feed is online, so you can download us and listen to us wherever you want. Please message us with any feedback if you think we're garbage, if you think we're really great, if you want some Zach ASMR, please let us know. It'll be good. You can really help us improve the podcast. And as always, please remember to... Like, subscribe, share, comment, rate, all that good stuff. Leave a review if you think we are deserving. If you know anybody else who you think might enjoy this, please share it with them. It's our best way of spreading. Thanks again! Bye, dudes! Speaking of big things... Well, um, do you know what the biggest thing is? me then you have that really big black hole yeah then i i think for moon <laughs> um <laughs> wow um T- t-rex t-rex <laughs> the band the titanic then t-rex the dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> yeah then t-rex the band on top of t-rex the dinosaur <laughs> then um. the beatles right oh uh, well then some beatles <laughs> I think you're going in the wrong direction, honestly. Right, okay. Um, um, the biggest thing is, of course, the the universe. Although maybe that doesn't really make much sense because... Uh, can I mean, can you call the, the universe is, the biggest hmm. thing? I mean, it's well, not... You wouldn't it... say the biggest thing in this box is the box no. itself. No, that's, but, um, The that's... point is the universe is very big. We haven't found anything bigger yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> um... I mean, there's some curious theories about that, but we're not going in that today. Nope. Uh, what we want, I want to talk about today is the beginning of the universe. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. I was there. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been honored with a, um, subpar sitcom series being named after <laughs> it. Um, it's the Big Bang. They also use um, theory in the name, so I think we can yeah. probably sue them. But that's, <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, we, we'll we'll be nice for now. Um, yeah, laugh track. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, the universe started with the the Big Bang, well, or rather, the universe as we know it started with the Big Bang. I wanted to talk about the Big Bang a bit because it's one of those things which I mean, pretty much everyone knows about. Um, but I think not that many people kind of know exactly how it's thought about in terms of scientific principles and, and actually like how much evidence there is for the Big Bang. I I don't know. I don't know if some people maybe think that it's, it's just, I mean, the phrase just a theory isn't a very good one in the first place because theories usually have a lot of evidence supporting them. But yeah, there's, there's a difference between, you know, like just a theory and what scientists refer to as a theory yeah which is usually you know supported hypothesized about and yeah has probably been for a, a few sort of rigorous tests yeah uh, so i wanted to do some garbage some reading and and maybe bring bring us up up to date in terms of the big bang there's mm-hmm. lots of different elements which i'm not going to go into but uh i guess the simplest thing is most people th- know that the Big Bang, in the Big like before the Big Bang, well, not before the Big Bang, but 
at the earliest point, the universe was very, very, very small. And then it kind of started expanding and expanded a lot. And that's kind of what we think of as the Big Bang. Is that right? Is that what you think of as the Big Bang? Um, kind of. A sort of rapid expansion of anything is basically yeah. an explosion. So yeah. I just imagine a, a big I mean, explosion and a bunch of trash just flies out of the middle of it. That might actually not be the best kind of visual metaphor. Um, no, I, I don't think it is. I because, don't think it actually was an explosion, um, but, but it's a bunch of stuff flying out. But yeah, I mean, that that's a very common thing. Like <laughs> I, I certainly think of like a, a a massive explosion just in space somewhere, which of course is is not accurate because there there wasn't i mean all the space was inside the the universe that is such a a bad sentence um <laughs> well we can't really we can't really imagine nothing so we've got to no, be easy I, I on mean, our fragile human brains yeah because so, we can only really understand things through things we can like see yeah so and that's kind of part of why i wanted to talk about it the earliest possible universe to get back on track um, a minute here was very, very dense and very hot. Uh, essentially, it was a very high energy situation. And um, and the, the reason we sort of know this and wh- why we think that the universe was very, very, very dense and very hot initially is because someone called Edwin Hubble, of course, the, the Hubble Space Telescope named after him, first observed that... Um, the distance from us on Earth to other galaxies far away correlates with a thing called their redshift. And I'm not going to go into explain that, but basically the result of this observation was that we had to believe that galaxies further away from us were traveling faster away, like than galaxies nearer to us. If you get what I mean. Um, right. That's probably a bad way of explaining it. Maybe. So uh, galaxies that are farther away from us are speeding up. Essentially, um, yeah. The velocity of, of the galaxies traveling away from us is is higher the further away you get, um, which is just kind of a, a confusing way <laughs> to explain the fact that something's expanding, right? I guess so things very far away from us are moving away at, at a very high speed um, and the implication of that is that event, like at some point in the far past, that they were much closer together. It's kind of a okay. It's a, I guess it's a kind of simple logical thing, but it's kind of difficult to explain in easy to understand terms. Um, <laughs> so the speeds at which things, the relative speeds at which things are moving apart, suggests that that eventually, uh, so, sorry, um, that at some point in the past they were closer together and extrapolating on this if things were closer together in the past that means at the earliest possible point in time they were extremely close together um which is why we think the earliest point of the universe was very very densely packed with matter and very hot because um there's a lot of energy in in essentially a very small space um I mean, that, that makes sense. And, yeah. you know, that that's good. That's a, that's the best theory we can come up with, really, given that all the information we have on space and the way things move is from, like, a little snapshot that we have now. Yeah. We, um, we can't see back in time. Well, it's interesting that you should say that, because we can get a snapshot of of that point, at the earliest point of the universe almost the earliest point um if we look at remnants from the big bang one of those remnants is something that we call cosmic background radiation i think i might have mentioned it briefly on uh, friends and theory before yeah um i think so yeah so i'll go into it a yeah, bit so more you're this saying time. It's, it's what keeps the universe um 2.7 yeah that's right yeah it, it's a background radiation and essentially it's radiation from that very, very hot, dense, young universe. Um, at some point, the universe cooled down as it, as it was expanding and so on. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into the, the physical principles of this because I struggled to understand them myself, let alone being able to accurately explain them. But <laughs> basically, during the cooling, 
ra- the, this radiation um, at, at a certain point was no longer absorbed by by stuff, um, and when light isn't when light or radiation isn't absorbed, that means it sort of is traveling through things rather than being absorbed by them. Um, so to put it simply, there was a point in the young universe at which this radiation stopped being absorbed and started traveling through things. And it's still traveling um, today because it's not been absorbed. Crucially, this kind of light that we observe is, you know, it's not associated with any star or galaxy or any other object at all. It's literally just background radiation, which is still traveling through the universe from the point at which it was scattered um, during the Big Bang, which is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, we'll we'll do <laughs> all the completely just mind shattering, yeah, physics and theories in episode I don't know thirty one, <laughs> where we all jump the shark. There's certainly some some kind of mind boggling stuff when you come to think about the Big Bang, and that's almost like as a result of the type of event it was because you know we, we can see this light this this background glow this just kind of faint background from from you know not long after the big bang um mm-hmm. but before that our our sort of system of understanding physics which which is called general relativity stops working which is why we have <laughs> it's why we have such a hard time thinking about the earliest possible state of the universe um there's a thing called the the planck epoch which is the <laughs> right it's the the first period of time in the universe that we can consider and it lasts from the beginning of the universe to a point which is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second after the beginning of the universe it's it's such a tiny length of time um, so, yeah it, it's it's <laughs> it's i think uh, i was looking it up i think it's zero point um and then like 40 or so zeros and then one it's it's that much of a second okay right. um and during this period unfortunately gen- general relativity can't adequately describe physics um there's there's theories which say that during this time there was such a high state of energy that all the fundamental forces that we know about might have been one singular force um what does that even mean though basically all of those electromagnetic forces and uh, and interactions and strong and weak forces and including the force of gravity at some point might have been acting as a single force which which literally cannot be considered under the the kind of rules of general relativity which is what make it what makes it different but anyway sort of the important thing about this is that um from that point onwards the big bang essentially happens and s- matter expands within a few moments we have um subatomic particles forming after that within a few minutes we have something like atomic nuclei forming um and and during this point of time the amount of matter compared to the amount of antimatter was slightly higher which is why we think that today in the current universe matter is predominant over antimatter um so it's a very formative period of time, uh, literally for the entire entirety of the universe. Um, <laughs> it was basically where where all the rules were laid down in yeah a very very short yeah. amount of time. I mean, I'm sorry if this is hard to follow. It, it, it's almost intentional because it it's um it's beyond our current understanding of physics. To like when we go to that point of the universe that far back um it's very difficult to understand but what we do know is that after that things expanded and the universe got um 
bigger. Uh, and, and by that, you can sort of think of it as all of the things in the universe got further away from each other. Yeah, because um, then you get into the question of what defines the boundaries of the universe. That is a very because, reasonable thing to think, but... Because we can't see. Yeah. There's it's, not just like a wall that just says... It's another. Or something. It's another one of those things which is not. It, it's more of a question of how we think about the universe rather than actual scientific principles. Because uh, typically, like I, I certainly think of the universe as like a, a big, I don't know, like a big sphere or a big um, disc or whatever you think of it, expanding into black or nothingness or whatever. But that's mm. that's not really that's not really an accurate way to think about it. Um, and it is, it is very difficult to think about it accurately because, because our, literally our entire, our entire observable universe is based on rules that our brains can, can comprehend. Uh, whereas things beyond that might not be based on rules that we can comprehend. Uh, yeah. It's kind of, kind of like the whole, you can't imagine a new color sort of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, we're getting very, very deep into the, the deep stuff here, but one of the things, one of the ways I, I heard it described was that if you were like, a, imagined yourself as a, a, little, a little dot, a little ant or something on the surface of a balloon, which, which was being blown up, um, Regardless of how big the balloon was, um, if you walked in any one direction for long enough, you would get back to the point you started at. So if you consider the surface of the balloon to be the entire universe, um, then regardless of how big, if you want to call it that, the universe gets, it's not as if it's like a... It's not as if it actually has an edge, because the universe doesn't really have an edge. It's just that the the space between things in the universe is getting larger, as if you were <laughs> blowing up the balloon. Um, I suppose another way to think of it would be to if you drew dots onto the surface of a balloon uh, and then blew it up, the the distance between the dots would get bigger, right? Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that like um, more dots are being created or that there is a a kind of yeah, like more dots are fine to fill in the gap. I yeah, guess. yeah. Um, uh, right. So, yeah, my the brain is, is starting to to break down. Let me leave you with one final mind-boggling, completely unexplainable okay. thing. Right. Let's um, get boggling. Yeah, uh, maybe I should have prefaced this whole section with uh, this stuff is just going to break your your mind, um, and there's pretty much I mean, nothing we, we, we can we do. We did about ask it. the listeners to brace their mind yeah. for impact. So. Yeah, we we did, uh, and this is the real stuff. Like, I've been putting off talking about this kind of thing for a while because it's it's not really explainable. Um, no, yeah, and and I know you want to talk about your your you know theories. Yeah, but I do think it's worth <laughs> your worth, your um, theories, Zach. It's worth that talking didn't about, make any sense. <laughs> uh, and it kind of. I hope even if I haven't managed to explain stuff that I've managed to kind of put it into context at least. Um, yeah, I, I think I understand it a lot better now. So anyway, that's one one person satisfied. The final thing I wanted to say was that um, obviously people people who know about the Big Bang know about the concept that the universe is expanding, and we've we've just talked a little bit about the fact that it's not really correct to assume that it's expanding into anything. It just is expanding. Um, however, the rate of expansion of the universe isn't constant. Uh, and it, if you think about this, it's kind of obvious. I suppose the Big Bang is a very, very rapid expansion of the universe, where the universe went from something that was very small, and in a relatively short period of time, it became very big. Um, and over time, over billions of years, the rate of the expansion of the universe, so the rate at which it's getting bigger, slowed down. And that's to be expected, I suppose. Um, and certainly that was put down to the fact that the the matter within the universe was exerting more gravitational pull on itself, I, I guess, or, or on the other matter in the universe. The more stuff there was in the universe, kind of the, the slower it was expanding. But, and this is the real mind breaker, five billion years ago, the universe expansion started accelerating 
Yeah, this is what I was going to say is, what is making it speed up? We don't know at all. <laughs> we have absolutely what? no idea. Okay, so, fair enough that being further away lessens the gravity, but it's like something's pushing them, isn't it? Well, no, yeah, you can think of it like this, right? The, so the universe expanded very quickly to begin with, and then it started going slower and slower. Like it wasn't, it's not as if it was shrinking, but the actual rate at which as it was expanding was getting slower. And then 5 billion years ago, it starts getting faster again. So it's expanding at a higher rate now. And we don't know why. Um, so one of the crazy theories about this was that if the universe expansion was at some point slowed down because of the force of gravity inside the universe, maybe it sped up because something with a, an absolutely colossal gravitational pull outside the universe um was no, causing no, no, it no, to no, speed no, up no, 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 yeah it's no, compl- no, no, it's no, no, completely no. insane so what people what science currently puts it down to is is something which is termed dark energy which is basically just a a catch-all term for this thing which we don't understand which is causing the universe to accelerate in its in its expansion so there's an assumption that dark energy whatever it is is in the universe and whatever this dark energy is, it tends towards accelerating the expansion of the universe. And that's as much of an explanation we have at the moment for why this is happening. Um, Scientists do their best. Yeah. I mean, it's completely insane um, that we we have absolutely no idea why this is happening um, or, or how long it's going to happen for or, you know what will happen afterwards so how fast will we actually get yeah i guess i just wanted to um to break everyone's minds for a bit so well done hopefully well I've done, done. That. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the universe is a is a, a very um amazing thing and there are parts of it which we don't have the tools to even think about yet so and maybe parts outside. Yeah, I mean, outside the universe is kind of an inaccurate thing to say, I guess. But um, <laughs> it's it's more or less the only way I could even think of to explain the concept. Yeah, uh, so. that's fair enough. I hope Let's... you've been suitably boggled um, and have an appreciation oh, yeah. for... How amazing and actually how well documented the Big Bang is. That's that was sort of my starting point for wanting to do this discussion. Um, it's very well documented, um, but just not very well understood. It was good. Thank you. To make things stand with no disrespect to the end. I Whew. Right. So let's close out with some good old fashioned. Um, good old-fashioned earth science, I guess. Okay, so Zach, has anybody ever told you that if you want to be confident, you just have to act confident? You know, that, that sort of um, yeah, almost self-deception sort of thing? Yeah, like a self-fulfilling action. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's been some research done into that sort of behavior. Okay. And um, apparently it, it is it is confirmed. The gist of what I'm about to talk of is is that we lie to ourselves to better convince other people. Right. Yeah, I can understand that. Um... So, in, in 1976, Robert Trivers um, wrote the foreword for the book What I Read, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, sort of saying okay. that we, do, we lie to ourselves to trick others... And that creates, like, you know, a social advantage, um, gives us all that, them, them good confidence and stuff. Right. And so him and other scientists have been doing this sort of stuff for, like, 40 years, looking into it. And now with a team, he has published a report supporting this claim. And there's there's a couple of, of just stuff supporting this claim, really. Okay. So this is published <clears throat> in the Journal of Economic Psychology. I think this is um this week's winner of best... Best methods. 
Uh, okay. Best best study design. Three hundred and six oh, online participants were asked to write a persuasive speech about a man called Mark, and they were told <laughs> there was a bonus depending on how effective it was. And so they were shown a bunch of videos that would portray Mark <laughs> in a certain way. And so some of them were like good, like he would he would pick up someone's wallet and return them to them. Right. And and some of them were bad. Like I don't know, he just punches a guy in the face or something. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what they found was that the people who were asked to make a positive speech would stop watching the videos after they'd seen the positive ones. Um, okay. So th- all the participants were shown the videos in like a, you know, an, an order from either good to bad or bad to good. Okay. Um, and they would also write more persuasive speeches. Right. And it's it's um so this study is supporting the idea of you know we we look for specific information to support certain claims when we have our own interests involved. Yeah, so sort of like thing. someone who wanted to write a speech about Mark being a good boy, uh, exactly, only watched the videos where he was doing good stuff and then was able to convincingly write a speech. Yeah, and and, and as soon as the bad ones they started, they're like, no, that's not my Mark. My <laughs> Mark wouldn't wouldn't Hashtag spit on the pavement. Not all marks. Not yeah. Hashtag um, not my mark. <laughs> um. So so other scientists um have spoken to our good friend Robert Trivers and done some research of him. Yep. Uh, such as von Hippel and Hugo Mercer, who have also done similar independent studies that support this. And um, it's a quote from von Hippel here: "If you need to convince somebody of something, if your career or social success depends on persuasion." then the first person who needs to be convinced is yourself. Yeah, I can get that. I understand that. Yeah, um, like if you have a conviction for anything, you're going to do a better job if you actually fully yeah. believe it. So I'm, I'm currently <laughs> convincing myself that I understand it and it's working. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm convincing myself that doing a podcast was a good idea. <laughs> and, yeah, um, I, and hopefully yeah. we can convince some other people as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's just um. just a joke, haha. <laughs> 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 Laugh track now. Yeah. All right, Zach, what have you got for All me? All right. <laughs> well, um, we tr- did we? I think we we failed to get in a good Jurassic Park reference earlier on. So here's one for you. No, we didn't. Um, that never happened. Uh, not if not if my editing has anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> this so, is a fresh. We didn't mention Jurassic Park yet. Uh, Here we, we go. Probably did. Um, <laughs> so um, some some uh, research from the Oregon State University has found a a tick inside amber. Um, as we know, right. amber is preserved, is, is like fossilized tree sap, basically. Tree sap. Mm-hmm. And inside the, the amber was a tick. And inside the tick was blood from a monkey, which it had Ooh. been, um, feeding from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, it's pretty amazing. So, um, but that's basically the plot of Jurassic Park, but yeah. with a mosquito and dinosaur blood. And so the, 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 the blood cells from the monkey were very, very well preserved, as was the tick. Uh, they could even identify um, punctures where basically the, t- the tick had been pulled off of, of the monkey and thro- thrown into some... Um, <laughs> thrown at a tree. Thrown into some tree sap, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, the tick had a bad time overall. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's indicative possibly of grooming behavior and also uh yeah very well preserved blood cells and so on it's from about 20 to 30 million years ago so it's quite a lot sort of more recent than the the dinosaur situation yeah Um, so we're not going to get jurassic park but we could have old monkey park old old monkey park Um, (laughs) i'm still not quite sure that's how it works but nevertheless (laughs) it's pretty cool yeah Yeah, i mean also just known as a zoo (laughs) um there you go there you go what else that's really cool like it actually happened yeah that's the cool thing basically and but the blood has been preserved for like thirty thousand years as well it's pretty spectacular because like a lot of a lot of that living tissue is very soft 
and doesn't doesn't last very well. So that shows that it, it is it is like a, a a good a good preservation situation technique. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice. All right. What else have we got? I was in Manchester for a while. I got a degree while I was there, which was um, pretty <laughs> crazy. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but actually, while I was there, um, in first year, the Graphene Institute was being built. And by my final year, it had been completed. And um, so they've kind of moved on from their, you know, origins in better lube for condoms, <laughs> which That's was very... very exciting. Yeah. I mean... But, um, then, so this is the National Graphene Institute at the University of Manchester, and they published something in Nature Nanotechnology. And if you thought your your mammal blood thing was cool, this is cooler. And I don't <laughs> fight me, fight me, Zach. This is All this right, is the yeah. best story. Yeah. Um. So essentially, they've made a graphene filter that can filter salt out of seawater, and that's that's okay. basically as good as it gets. That's it. That, I mean, that, like, depending on how quick and easy it is, that, that sounds like a, a very important thing to have. It's it's a very big deal, like, especially considering that, you know, most of the planet surface is seawater. A lot of people don't have a lot of water, but could have access to seawater. And we do have a habit of ruining fresh water and then pumping out into the sea. Um, yeah, we do have, have that. So, I mean, what is, is it? Are they potentially thinking actually we could convert seawater into drinkable water? But I think so, yeah. Um, I'll talk, I don't think it's anywhere near being, you know, like a commercial thing, but I'll, yeah. I'll talk you through the science. So previously, sure. these graphene oxide membranes in water were able to block large ions. Okay. They sort of like swelled up in the water. And um, the pores, the pores were able to block large ions coming through, but not the water or salt, which are very small. Yeah. Um, but they've further developed the membrane because they're not quitters, <laughs> and so they've managed to make a new one which doesn't swell, and they can precisely control the pore size. So right. here's here's where we're gonna get we're gonna get technical. So when common salts are dissolved in water, they form a sort of shell of water around the salt through. You know, electro, yeah, electrostatic the bonds, attraction. hydrogen bonds, maybe, probably, yeah. Pro- there's good, good bonds, yeah. And um, so, but the, it's bigger than just one molecule of water. So the pore size is big enough to block the shells of water with salt in them, but not molecules of water themselves. Okay, that's. I mean, that sounds like a good way to do it, I suppose, because you you block like the thing which actually happens when salt is present in water, but not the water itself, obviously. Mm. Um, cool. Yeah, because not, not all water becomes yeah. super salty. Yeah, yeah. It's like just just the parts of the water which have salt salt um, ions and molecules and stuff. So, like, basically, yeah. this breakthrough just completely debunks the film Waterworld, I think. Oh, man, I haven't seen that film, but I've always meant to, to watch it. Um, I don't know. It's like Mad Max, but on boats. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty sweet to me. And everyone's thirsty. Uh, I don't know. I don't actually think it's very good. Um, no, fair. <laughs> and we're probably going to get some is, hate for that. Really, yeah. It, this is really cool. Um, and hopefully it will help address water yeah. scarcity in the future. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really good. Like, this is this is a thing. This is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, there's um, another big deal I'll tell you about. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, a it's... new deal, the five-year plan. <laughs> uh, we talked a little bit last week about um, a guy who managed to move uh, his limbs, his his arms. I think wasn't it? Um, I can't remember quite the story. Yeah, I mean, he had lost the ability to do it, and then it was restored. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah. We talked about a man who can move his arms. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, this this week there's been uh, some advances. It's not the same guy. I should pre- preface this with, but a, a different okay. patient who had unfortunately lost the the use of his legs. He's become paralyzed. Um, has managed to intentionally move his legs and stand and and make motions that were described as step like uh, for the Ooh. first time in three years. Um, so this was done at at a I'm not quite sure the pronunciation, but I think it might be the Mayo Clinic. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I had to double check that it was a real place, not just like a dumb name, because... Again, yeah. deliberate or not, who knows? Yeah. Pinas um, and Mayo. <laughs> it's a non-profit medical practice. Uh, and they did a, a whole, whole bunch of therapies and tests and stuff. Um, and it essentially resulted in this guy being able to move his legs, having been paralyzed for, th- for three years. Uh, and this was done by an implanted electrode. Um, which sent electrical signals to the spine and basically allowed the brain to to send signals to the motor neuron um, in the spine and allowed him to to intentionally move his his legs. So yeah, ah. there you go. Okay. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um. Um. I. I mean, God, we're at the point where like. Any problem in the human body can be addressed and fixed. Well, I, I mean, I guess we're, 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 there's still lots of issues. Um, oh, yeah, of, I of think... course. But, like, this is so, like, we keep saying it, but this is so sci-fi and, like, unreal. Yeah. There's, a Completely... lot of, there's a lot of hopeful research, I suppose, um, is a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and, and treatments that are being tested out and possibly at some point could be used on a much wider scale so yeah it's all good Sci- um, scientists try their best which I- i'm feeling is uh is scientists try their is best. possibly a, a, th- a theme of this episode <laughs> um, yeah because I-, I feel like we're putting them down but we really shouldn't no no we're not, um, we're not putting them down we're saying scientists well if you are a scientist and you feel like we've put you down Please rate, comment, and subscribe, and leave us a review on iTunes, yeah. telling us about how we did you wrong. Go away, because you suck, scientists. Um. Don't please be nice. <laughs> be no, nice. Scientists are right. great. So, um, just a, man, a quick, quick. Let's wrap up. Yeah, um. quick section. <laughs> I'm calling revisiting the theory. Um, so we were talking about a woman, a woman. I've forgotten her name. I'm very sorry. That feels really bad now. <laughs> And she she had made organoids in a petri dish to simulate, you know, the female oh, reproductive yeah. system. I remember. Yeah. And um, I was like, "Well, it's and, not a brain. Uh, <laughs> they haven't grown a brain. Uh, someone uh, grew a, a brain organoid oh in my a petri dish." There God. We go. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Um, the, the title for this article being "Mini Brains from the Petri Dish." Wow. Well, I think that's as so, good a, a note as any to end on. Um, yeah. So, uh, f- thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, everyone. Um, uh, this got kind of and to uh, to all the happy new year. Yeah, it got kind of crazy. Uh, I think this episode. But... I mean, if your mind isn't blown, then please come back for next episode. <laughs> yeah. If your mind, if your mind is blown. Please try and 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 somehow make make it fixed again for next episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, we do not accept any damages. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> man, not legally All responsible. Right. I've been Peter Badstone. <laughs> yeah, shut shut this down. We need to we need to shut this down. Uh, I've been Zach Brew. And uh, yeah, the, the music that you've heard throughout the episode and we'll see us out is the song and by tally hall from the album good and evil definitely check them out uh and it's really cool of them to let us use the song in the podcast and uh yeah yeah now now we're gonna shut it down for real yeah surfs up shut it down surfs down surfs down she opens her lips and it goes like this